notes are not just perfectly even in context. So you work on it being even so that then you have control of the mechanism and then you're, you can kind of think like, and now these notes like go over there. What's going on? It's Jason Heath and Bow Speed Geography, a new book by principal basis of the Houston Symphony, Robin Kesselman has been making me rethink so many concepts of the bow. Let's check it out. I had this left hand injury at the end of my undergrad. Luckily I was studying with David Moore being um, just the perfect person to kind of go down that rabbit hole with. And he was super encouraging of, of me bringing these exercises or working on Bodicini on, you know, on, on harmonics, so all these things like he was just super encouraging. So, some of those exercises and sort of the, the way of thinking about building both evenness of sound as well as kind of crescendo diminuendo like developments or recessions of sound from the standpoint of bow speed from like a visual standpoint sort of like if something sounds even and there's then it should look like an even pull of bow which is like a very basic concept and then similarly if something was changing if something's getting louder it's sort of like speeding up but then balancing the speed weight and placement instead of sort of thinking of them as all these all three units that are there all the time, which they are sort of starting with bow speed or like distance traveled and then balancing the others accordingly. And I find it super interesting and intriguing how Robin uses bow speed as the primary variable between the three speed, weight, and placement. So like I said, if something was going to crescendo, you're going to kind of develop the bow speed, like speed up. If you didn't balance the weight to that, then it would just sort of hydroplane and launch off. And what would happen is you would get an increasingly more transparent sound. So we get into this and just the way that this is laid out with all these QR codes, they'll take you to examples of Robin playing through these exercises. And so great to have some text and musical examples, and then also some really cool visuals in terms of bow division as we get later into this. I always love doing like group classes if I go somewhere. And so something sort of evolved into like, oh, maybe like a handout. They sort of unpack one of these concepts. And then so there, was, there was a few of those together. And then over COVID, I really like, people are asking me about this. And just also for myself, there's a way that like this logically progresses and like is sort of codified in my mind. I sort of come at it from every angle in the book in terms of like, there's some verbal descriptions. There's like um, figures or diagrams that really help me like i'm a visual learner there's also and then also obviously like just regular musical notation um as well as there are qr codes all over the book that link to a youtube series of just me playing some of these because there's certain things where you can talk about it all day but you really it's actually more basic concept just to, to see somebody do it and then also to be able to use that qr code and check out the videos that's a cool bonus <laughs> I'm going to bow at my best. I need rosin that will perform. And that's why I am loving this new rosin from the sponsor of today's video. This is Upton Bass's Double Bass Rosin. It is a very cool formula. It is similar to Pops. I'd say it's about 80% like Pops and 20% like a Swedish rosin, like Carlson or Nyman's. It gets a nice bite just like Pops, but it has a little bit of a darker Swedish complexity to it. I have been digging it. I'm super happy with it. It has been working great when I sub with the San Francisco Symphony and play other projects. We've got it linked up in the description below and thank you to Upton for sponsoring the channel. The thing that I was really interested in realizing that I needed the most work on was just like legato and sustain, the control of that. And I wasn't seeing a lot of that in those books, like in, in terms of like, there were sort of descriptions of them, but there wasn't like how do you practice something that seems kind of like ambiguous? Like once you're bowing a node, it's sort of like what's ha what are the subtleties that are happening over the pull of that bow? And how do you kind of measure and look into that? Just being that like once you can kind of measure something and have something recreatable, that's like the same, like I'm going to practice this thing and in the exact same way and then kind of like notch it up like metronomically or look at things kind of more in depth. I needed something that was like measurable to then be practicable.
-hmm. just the idea that bow speed can seem very ambiguous, but it's really just speed is just distance over time, like miles per hour. Like you're seeing a car go down the street and it's like, well, how fast is it going? And it's like, I don't know. But then the cop, you know, clocks you at like 45 miles per hour. So it's, it's a very specific time. That just means that you're just going to go 45 miles in the course of an hour. So it's like a, a specific speed. So once you can measure that, then with the bow, it, with the bow, it could be like, if you take a constant, like in miles per hour, the constant is a mile. You're measuring everything against a mile. So with the book, you can pick any constant. For a lot of the exercises, I just put the constant as one length of bow. But one thing that's very important, I think in the next edition of it, it will make other constants equally as represented. So it's not always about always using a full bow or always using a half bow. It's just about what you have to choose some distance that's standardized so then you can like measure a speed. So Robin has stop time segments and torque rhythms. And I have found myself really kind of thinking differently about my bow and about sound and certainly about bow speed as I've dug into these. If you're using the constant of one full length of bow and you have metronome at 60 and you say you can describe a bow speed as this bow speed like exactly is Two counts at 60 over one pull of the book. The aspect of the book is like sort of using segmenting tools. Like it's sort of like putting tape along your bow. Like when we're all remembered like young, young students, or if anybody has young students, it's like, you know, sometimes you'll take a bow and you'll, you'll put like a little piece of white out or a tape like halfway. So the student can see like, oh, this is you're exactly halfway through the bow or like court or quarters. But then I wanted to be able to sort of measure like, okay, if, if it's a totally even pull, if it's totally even bow speed, then exactly halfway through the amount of time. So using this like two counts of 60, exactly at one count of 60, I should be exactly halfway through the bow. And um, similarly looking even more specifically, maybe I've got uh, then even like one quarter of the way through the time. So after each eighth note, I should be one quarter of the way through the bow. If I was really being honest with myself, like I couldn't really do that. Like it's actually harder than it sounds. I mean, it's one of those things where conceptually should be there, but you're dealing with the, the mechanics of your body and whatever. And so even that kind of foundational skill set, I just felt like really required some, if I wanted to be able to do that, which I felt like music required me to be able to do that, then I was, uh, as, as with any skill, like was something that should be built and, and practiced in a, in a thoughtful way. I feel that this is an important contribution to double bass pedagogy, uh, certainly, but also string pedagogy. And there's just not any resource quite like this that I've encountered. If you found something like this, leave a comment and let me know. So instead of having tapes all over my bow, I would just sort of like use torque pulses. It's not weight because it's not like you're bowing in and out like this, but over the course of a pull, like a down bow, then I'm just going to sort of tag these little moments that just sense in terms of sensation, but also just visually say like, oh, I'm pulling and like, okay, there's the halfway point. Is it happening through the time? The more advanced your control of, of an even bow speed would be, then the higher the subdivisions of those of those pulses would be accounted for. So you can do all of these starting down bow or up bow. I've had my metronome on 60 a lot as I've been working through these and I've been taking my time doing one or possibly two a day and then getting into these mixing up of the patterns. So you've got quarter notes and quarter note triplets, eighth notes and all of that. Weight makes no sound. Like weight is a static position and same with point of contact. So it's kind of like the way you would set a diaphragm or, or, or in the wind player, it's like you'd set your armature. That's sort of like weight, but it doesn't, doesn't make any sound. And so bow speed is, is the dynamic variable. It's like the thing that creates. I love this slow acceleration of the subdivisions and deceleration. I find that super interesting and just bringing awareness to each segment of the bow. That's been really helpful in just objectivizing the bow. The bass requires such a different level of articulation or the clarity of the instrument being like an octave, at least an octave below our, our most recent cousin, and then maybe several octaves below the upper string players, upper upper string players. And 
So there's just need, there needs to be more release in the sound. I mean, it's sort of like, even if you think about even within our world, like if you think about the way you articulate and connect separate notes in an orchestral context on the G string versus the E string, like you'd say kind of, let's say the Turkish March letter K up the G string versus the opening of Schubert nine, third movement on the E string. Those strings just require such different levels of, of space and, and short and short. I mean, ultimately same, same aural length going to be a little shorter if it's a lower note. Maybe these are reasons why our legato is a little behind the times, I think. And when what what's one thing that I think is tr incredibly illuminating that I would encourage anybody to do is to find some like great violinists that they love. Could be from their sort of like previous era of like the Heinrich Schering Heifetz, like that era, or it could be James Ennis, Hadelik, Hilary Hahn, McGill, like Kavikos, whatever, all these things. And just watch them with the sound off and you will know exactly the way they are shaping. You can see how analytical Robin is in his approach to technique, although he's such a fabulous musician. So just like sharpening the tools that you use for expressivity. There's a frequent tendency to when we want to diminuendo, we sort of keep a constant speed, but lift out of the string. It's changing the timbre of this note. It's not just like taking one timbre and making it softer. Like I think dynamic within one timbre is like side to side. And then timbre is like placement or like lifting up and out and pushing in. So it's just something that as soon as you kind of put your eye on that and your mind on that, both and other people you look up to as well as in your own playing, it's sort of like you can't unsee what you're seen for me that was my experience and it's just it was like a little of a lazy move to kind of just like lift out of the string when you wanted softer um at the end of a note or something like that and and then just it's a way to like finish a note finish a phrase but with the same like beauty and integrity that the whole whole string has and i just think upper string players are a little further along with that and on even bow speed, which we use so frequently, and this can be a really tricky topic to dissect. I think the way that he did it here and mixing up the uh, explanation, speed equals distance over time, and then also the visuals and the musical examples, and then being able to see Robin play examples himself, which is just super helpful. One thing that's important to say is, is that this book and this sort of method is not a in any way a complete guide to the right hand it's really like a way of measuring and practicing and understanding a, a, and getting a better understanding and control of bow speed which then is to be applied into your life there is nothing about right hand which is without context then there's the magic of like actual music making or actual music of like the the range of the instrument or the type of vibrato you're going to use or like the super subtle like nuances within a note or a series of notes the prerequisite to being able to sort of do those things is like kind of control of the mechanism or under a better higher understanding mechanism so it's kind of like with orchestra strokes we practice evenness right like all the time like everybody's super into like not hearing the down bows and like practicing uneven rhythms and everything and so the reason we do that is because it's a stepping stone to then making music like notes are not just perfectly even in context so you work on it being even so that then you have control of the mechanism and then you're you can kind of think like and now these notes like go over there and you're just like able to do that but it's sort of like there's a prerequisite of evenness and so i think about that with both speed too is like if you want these like super complex like nuanced like artistic shapes in a legato context then it's like well first can you just like pull an even bow and then can you maybe choose between like go between two different uh bow speeds so it's like can you do like a slow fast slow whatever but not in in like just like blocks like one even bow speed and then a different even bow speed something like that and then the the kind of next thing would be can you evenly pace so instead of even bow speed what about like even acceleration of speed and I love that he sprinkles in repertoire, he goes on repertoire reductions, how you would apply this in practical situations. That's a look at Bow Speed Geography by Robin Kesselman. And if you want to learn more about the bow and its many uses in leveling up, check out what we've got linked up here.